Uh, recognizing that we have uh, a, a broad range of backgrounds in the audience, I'd like to really start uh, with basics. Uh, uh, the first thing that we uh, make sure that everyone understands is that uh, venous thromboembolism is uh, comprised of two elements, um, deep vein thrombosis uh, and pulmonary embolism, and collectively these are generally referred to as venous thromboembolism. Uh, I love this uh, radiograph. There's never one like that in the real world, but uh, this really allows you to see the venous anatomy of the entire leg, leg just beautifully in a normal person. And uh, here you can see the uh, deep vein. Uh, of course, I should be going up rather than down. Uh, the deep veins of the calf. So generally calf clots uh, are, are clots that form in these individual veins that, that come together at about the knee at the popliteal to begin the uh, common deep venous system going on up uh, to the heart. Uh, and here on the uh, surface, you can see the superficial venous system, which are the veins that, that, that many of us can see uh, on our legs, particularly when we exercise. Uh, and these communicate uh, uh, through these little perforating veins. So that's the, uh, the normal view uh, of the, uh, of the uh, venous system of the leg, where deep vein thrombosis uh, commonly forms. Um, a little bit more magnified view of the upper thigh. Here's a patient who's had their hip replaced. You can see the uh, hip uh, uh, prosth prosthesis uh, right there. Uh, and here you can see the uh, common femoral and iliac vein, uh, and it's, there's something inside there. Uh, it's not open and, and, and clear. Uh, and we're talking about a, a, a tube uh, at this level, which is about the size of a garden hose. So there's a lot of space there, uh, even though it's flexible and collapsible, there's a lot of space there for quite a large clot uh, to develop. Uh, and these clots uh, can develop uh, in, in a few hours, perhaps a few days, uh, which is quite a contrast to arterial disease, uh, where arterial obstructions uh, often take a lifetime to develop. Now, this is a little tough at breakfast time, but this is uh, my first introduction uh, back in 1971. Uh, it's been a long time that I've studied the epidemiology of venous thrombosis. Uh, and this is an autopsy of a lung showing a, a, a large clot uh, obstructing uh, major branches of the uh, pulmonary uh, artery and vein. Uh, and uh, this is a, uh, uh, not a pea-sized object. This is uh, several inches long, perhaps half an inch in diameter or so. Uh, fatal pulmonary emboli uh, are, are significant uh, uh, sized uh, thrombi that uh, generally originate uh, in the deep veins of the leg, uh, break loose, uh, and then travel with the circulation uh, through the right heart and, and lodge in the lung. Uh, and uh, the evidence from multiple uh, autopsy studies suggests that uh, pulmonary embolism originates uh, from thrombi in the deep veins of the leg in, in more than 90% uh, of the uh, major pulmonary emboli that are, that are, that are known. Uh, in addition to uh, simply saying deep vein thrombosis, uh, we have the proximal deep vein thrombosis, which is generally referred to as clots in the lower extremities above the knee, uh, we have isolated calf thrombi, which uh, uh, stop before they come into the, uh, uh, the larger vessels at about the knee. We have superficial thrombi, which uh, again are in superficial veins uh, on the surface of the leg uh, or arm. Uh, and we have upper extremity VTE. So there are quite a variety uh, of DVT, uh, and it's appropriate to ask the question, are all of these equal, are they all equally important? And, and the answer is no, that proximal DVT uh, is head and shoulders above the rest in terms of its uh, importance uh, clinically and its potential to uh, cause death from pulmonary embolism. However, these other forms of DVT are, are often the early stage, which then develops uh, into the more life-threatening uh, stage. So we can't ignore the others, but certainly proximal DVT is the most important of the DVTs. And with PE, of course, fatal pulmonary embolism, fortunately, is relatively rare. Uh, symptomatic pulmonary embolism and silent pulmonary embolism uh, are generally uh, the terms used to describe the spectrum of PE, and, and we'll tell you more about that in a moment. Uh, so if we look at the data, for example, estimates based upon elderly medical patients who do not receive effective prophylaxis in the hospital, um, we could look at a spectrum of clinical impact from relatively low to uh, fatal, uh, and then look at the relative uh, estimated uh, incidence uh, of these events uh, in this population. So about 25% uh, of patients with severe medical illnesses uh, 
or hospitalized will develop a calf DVT if they don't receive prophylaxis. About 30% will develop any type of DVT, calf, thigh. Uh, about 35% will develop any type of VTE, including pulmonary embolism. Uh, about 5% will develop major venous thromboembolism, uh, that is generally clots above the knee, and about 1% will have a fatal pulmonary embolism. So again, this is an important perspective. Again, this disease exists in a continuum. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, the most serious uh, end of the continuum is rare, uh, but it's one disease. And uh, this is quite an old slide. For a long time, people have tried to emphasize the uh, relative rarity of fatal pulmonary embolism, uh, a little bit more common symptomatic VTE, and the great mass, sort of the uh, iceberg below the water of silent, uh, not symptomatic, not clinically recognized venous thromboembolism. But uh, taking that slide that goes back 30 or 40 years and looking at something a little more updated, um, it's, we've learned even more that it's not just calf DVT that are silent. Uh, there is, roughly speaking, uh, about uh, a third or less uh, of VT, whether it's fatal PE, non-fatal PE, proximal DVT or calf DVT, uh, less than half of DVT in all of these categories uh, is recognized clinically. So this presents a very important perspective on why prophylaxis is so essential based upon risk factors and not based upon symptoms of DVT. So we have a big challenge. Epidemiologists like me have a challenge in measuring what is this disease. Is it increasing, decreasing, who gets it? Clinicians have a challenge in determining which patients are at risk. Uh, only about 10 to 20 percent of VTE is clinically recognized, as I just mentioned. Historically, uh, autopsies provided the objective evidence that PE caused between 5 and 10 percent of deaths in hospital. Uh, today, autopsy is rarely performed, uh, and uh, we've lost that yardstick. Uh, objective diagnostic tests for, for VTE are rarely ordered in asymptomatic patients, so we really don't know much about the asymptomatic patients from uh, routine objective testing outside of clinical trials. And uh, billing codes, ICD-9 codes for DVT and PE uh, are, are useful, but you have to be careful. They're quite imperfect, especially the codes for DVT. The PE codes are a little better, but uh, we have to be careful about uh, reports uh, about the frequency of this disease that are based upon billing codes. The uh, recognizing that, that we're doing the best we can to estimate um, incidents uh, and overall prevalence from uh, uh, imperfect tools. The best data uh, that are available uh, come from John Height uh, from the Mayo Clinic uh, using the resources of the Rochester Epidemiology Project uh, and extrapolating to the U.S. as a whole. Uh, they estimated that about 900,000 patients in the United States each year have a clinically evident VTE uh, and about 300,000 uh, people die from PE each year. Uh, so who are these people? Uh, well, I, I like trying to stratify risk factors a little bit, although it's somewhat artificial uh, and, and there aren't black or white divisions. But my effort to stratify risk and try to put it into perspective a little bit began by looking at the publications uh, and, and looking for risk factors that by themselves had an odds ratio of greater than 10. Uh, and as you can see, for hip and knee, leg fracture, hip and knee replacement, major general surgery, major trauma, spinal cord injury, uh, they're all related to surgery or trauma. And you don't need a calculator to figure out that these patients need prophylaxis. A single risk factor is sufficient to identify high-risk patients in this case. Uh, and uh, for all of the efforts to do a better job uh, in identifying high-risk patients through looking at multiple risk factors, we, we shouldn't let people get confused uh, about this very high-risk group. Uh, you only need one risk factor <clears throat> to know these people are very high risk. There's uh, quite a large group in my mid-range, two to nine odds ratio, uh, and uh, there could be some arguments about uh, which side uh, of, the, uh, of, the of the range uh, that these things fall on. But from my uh, perspective, previous history of venous thromboembolism uh, could easily have been put in the top group. It's the most important of the, of the moderate level risk factors and consistently shows uh, odds ratios of six, seven, eight uh, in, in trials. Uh, and then stroke, cancer, chemotherapy, central venous line, et cetera, uh, are all uh, important risk factors uh, and uh, uh, should be remembered uh, in looking at patients and assessing their risk. Uh, 
Uh, and I particularly wanted to show this, uh, this data from Perandoni uh, showing that uh, patients uh, who have a VTE uh, recur uh, about 10% within one year, about 20% within three years, uh, a history of venous thromboembolism uh, other than major trauma or operation uh, is the most important risk factor to keep in mind, and, and particularly in, in, uh, in non-surgical, non-traumatic patients. Uh, fortunately, a history of venous thromboembolism is pre perhaps uh, present in less than 5% of hospitalized patients, but when it is present, don't let it slip by. The uh, last group that I've termed weak risk factors are weak but not insignificant, uh, but generally have published odds ratios of less than two. Uh, many of these exist in a continuum. Uh, bed rest uh, greater than three days or, or longer and longer is, is, is worse and worse. Uh, immobility, uh, again, we love to talk about airplane flight and long car rides, but in general, immobility is a relatively weak risk factor, but the longer immobility is, is, is uh, more of a concern. Uh, age, uh, a moderate or mild risk factor, but the more age increases, the more it should be paid attention to. Uh, and uh, uh, the others are, are again, well-known uh, risk factors. Uh, that I put in the weak risk factor category based upon odds ratios from publications of less than two. And again, it's important to remember that age is very important uh, from an epidemiological point of view. The uh, incidence uh, of, of VTE uh, from about one in a thousand up to about three in a thousand up to maybe five in a thousand uh, goes up dramatically uh, for both men and women uh, with increasing age. Uh, traditionally, we talked about surgical patients' risk going up dramatically after age 40, but in general, you can see how this curve goes up exponentially, particularly after age 60 or so. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind, so even though the, uh, the odds for an individual patient who's over 65 uh, may not be uh, sufficient in themselves to indicate prophylaxis, uh, it's an important factor to consider along with other risk factors in assessing the overall risk in individual patients. Well, the American College of Chess Physicians started uh, quite a long time ago, more than 20 years ago, to think about how could they help physicians uh, to make good decisions uh, about uh, VT prophylaxis. Uh, and they uh, made a, a summary of who was at risk and, and, and who should be a candidate for prophylaxis. Uh, in a publication uh, several years ago, we looked at the uh, federal uh, uh, HCUP uh, database uh, of U.S. hospital discharges, and we reflected the ACCP guideline to find risk of VTE, the risk factors from the ACCP list, against those 38 million hospital discharges in, in 2003. Uh, and we found uh, that 12 million of these, or about 31 percent, had uh, sufficient risk of VTE uh, in, to uh, suggest these patients should have received prophylaxis. Uh, and it was particularly interesting to see that 11% uh, of patients uh, had major operation, but 20% uh, were non-surgical, uh, non-traumatic uh, uh, patients with serious medical illness, uh, adding up to 31% uh, uh, of, of hospital patients uh, in U.S. acute care hospitals. Again, it helps take from the uh, uh, individual's trial data and, and try to make it uh, concrete in terms of what the implications are for the U.S. healthcare system. One perspective on this disease that's evolved uh, quite recently is that we're pretty sure that we know what's going on. This is where we started 30 or 40 years ago, looking at this disease and the importance of recognizing risk factors related to surgery or trauma. But that only accounts for about 30% of the patients who are going to get uh, VTE. Uh, more recently, in the last 10, 15 years, we've begun to pay more attention to patients with serious medical illnesses who are hospitalized and the period immediately following hospitalization. That's another about 30% of the patients who are going to get VTE in the U.S. Uh, this year. Uh, there are 40% of patients, uh, about 20% uh, with cancer in the community setting, uh, out of the hospital, uh, long-term uh, survivors or, or treatment for cancer, and then another broad group of idiopathic community unprovoked uh, and we have to recognize that our well-designed trials and our experience, the potentially preventable venous thromboembolism, right now our confidence is around this 60%. We have a lot to learn about how to deal with this other 40%. And when we look at, uh, this is a paper that Sam Goldhaber uh, published uh, in 2010, when we look at the risk factors in the community out of the hospital se setting, the picture changes a little bit. Uh, it, it's a lot less helpful. Uh, we don't have uh, odds ratios of 10. Uh, we start looking at people with older age, uh, uh, 
cancer, prior VTE is probably the most powerful one, venous insufficiency, pregnancy, trauma, frailty, immobility. Uh, it's a challenge trying to identify the community-dwelling patients uh, uh, well after discharge from hospital for major surgery or medical illness uh, and uh, their continuing risk. And uh, I think a question that uh, will be uh, contributed to by this meeting is uh, when, you know, can we really prevent VT in the community? Do we know how to do it? When does the risk begin? When does it end? Um, and uh, what types of prophylaxis are feasible economically and practically, uh, effective uh, and safe? Uh, the idea of a 10-year risk uh, of VD, VTE, uh, it, it sounds like uh, you know, we think about heart disease or, or arterial disease. Venous thrombosis hasn't thought that way before, and now we're challenged to sort of think about change our mindset from the acute hospital period to the community-based 10-year risk uh, of VTE, and do we have the tools to do something about it? I don't think we know yet. Uh, and another thing that's quite appropriate to remember is in this population, um, the non-surgical, the, the medically ill, uh, community-dwelling people with cancer, et cetera, um, what are the quality-adjusted life years gained? Uh, it's wonderful to feel like we prevented death from pulmonary embolism, but we have to recognize there is a significant population of patients who will die of a PE uh, within a, a, a brief time before an inevitable death from something else, uh, and uh, it's appropriate to keep that in mind in terms of uh, marshalling our resources and strategies. Uh, a lot of time is spent talking about pulmonary embolism as the devil or the target here, but there's a much broader uh, morbidity uh, and uh, concern about this disease, including the acute morbidity of the DVT and PE and the hospitalization and treatment and perhaps some bleeding uh, that might occur if treatment is managed carefully. Uh, recurrence, uh, which we've already talked about, is fairly common despite good treatment. Uh, and then the post syndrome, syndrome, uh, which uh, is really a miserable experience for so many people who, uh, who suffer from it as the long-term consequences of having the valves in their veins damaged by venous thrombosis. Um, so we think about the annual burden of this disease, not just death from pulmonary embolism. The estimated 600,000 non-fatal cases of VT in the United States each year result in a substantial burden, hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations, extended hospital stays, and direct medical costs that have been estimated between about six and eight billion dollars per year. And of course, uh, going back to the post syndrome, um, you know, painful swollen legs, difficulty walking, uh, disability, uh, usually people, particularly who work on their feet, are unable to go back to work, uh, significant decreases in quality of life, uh, functional status. Uh, th this is uh, an important part of this disease to keep in mind uh, uh, as we think about solutions. Uh, the uh, Surgeon General, uh, called a uh, call to action uh, on venous thrombosis pulmonary embolism, and, and in their 2008 report uh, issued uh, uh, some summary comments. Uh, venous thrombosis embolism is a major public health problem, frequently underestimated. The failure to provide adequate prophylaxis and treatment puts patients at risk. Uh, it's a leading preventable cause of death in hospital patients. And there's an increasing appreciation of VTE as a chronic disease that constitutes a substantial burden in the community setting. So, and then my own personal uh, conclusions are, this is probably the third most common preventable death in the U.S. You can measure it against stroke or a heart attack, or you can measure it against smoking and obesity and diet. Uh, either way, it's about the third most common preventable cause of death uh, in the U.S. Uh, Evidence-based models for estimating VT risk in visual patients uh, have been around for a while. They're more emerging. Uh, they're getting more and more founded on solid uh, evidence. But there needs to be more work to done to validate these so we can have confidence that they can be used to make decisions about individual patients and everyday care. And the burden of community VT risk is substantial, but we need more research uh, to quantify the risks and benefits uh, of um, yet to be uh, identified approaches to reduce long-term VT risk in the community setting. Thank you very much.